Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, As always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. If you haven't subscribed there, do that. Uh, I give away a free uh, 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Great little study guide. A uh, great little refresher if you're, you know, doing pharm- in pharmacology classes, uh, taking board exams, final exams. Um, great little resource refresher uh, that's not going to cost you a dime there. So, simply an email, uh, we'll we'll get you that. We'll get you updates on on when we've got new content and things available too. Uh, so again, reallifepharmacology.com. Go check that out. All right, so let's get into the drug of the day today, and that is melatonin. And this is a, a, a medication, or I guess it's more classified as a supplement, uh, at least in the United States, readily available over the counter. And from my experience, it is readily taken by a lot of uh, patients. <laughs> um, I, I, it feels like about 20 to... 30% of patients are, are taking melatonin. That that might be an exaggeration and a little bit high, um, but I can assure you in, in my work as a consultant, um, I, I see it on a, on a daily basis for sure. So um, with that said, it's it's used primarily for insomnia and to, to help with sleep. Mechanistically, how does it do that? Well, melatonin is actually found uh, naturally occurring in the body, and it promotes uh, sleep and the circadian rhythms, the the kind of sleeping and, and waking cycle. And it's actually made uh, from the amino acid tryptophan. So you've always heard, or maybe you've you've heard around Thanksgiving, you know, and turkey and and tryptophan, it makes you sleepy and that type of thing. And so um, that's kind of a little bit where that comes from in that tryptophan is a kind of a building block uh, for the the production of of melatonin so um, interestingly kind of as as a a person ages this uh, secretion of this hormone that you know helps uh, promote sedation and and sleepiness and that type of thing uh, varies uh, with with age so at approximately three to four months, melatonin production kind of begins. Um, and with that, it, it starts to, you know, help kind of in, ensure that sleep-wake cycle, which makes a lot of sense if you think about, uh, you know, younger children, babies, they, they generally don't sleep well at night. They, they don't have that routine and that schedule, and, and melatonin um, certainly may play a role in kind of the development of you know when it's time to go to sleep and and when it's time to to get up and that type of thing. So um, this uh, melatonin production release secretion um, peaks at around the, the toddler age, one to three, somewhere in there, and then it it, it kind of stabilizes, plateaus, and then obviously as patients get into adulthood and you know age, this secretion actually does decline. Uh, over time. So in a geriatric patient, for example, um, that secretion may be a lot less than when they were 20 years old, for example. And I I think this, you know, potentially, theoretically has a significant role in that, you know, insomnia is fairly common um, in elderly adults. So that certainly could, could play a role there. And, you know, might be why you see melatonin used in in those type of situations in in elderly patients or see it so frequently. So one of the one of the challenges I have with melatonin is it is considered a, a dietary supplement, and so companies don't really have to to go through the uh, usual FDA process phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, um, and so that leads to a little bit of lack of regulation on, you know, which products are, you know, adequate and, and which ones, you know, might not make the grade and, and that type of thing. And and so that that gives me a little pause for concern, uh, as always, or at least gives me something to, to think about if patients aren't responding or aren't doing well or, or whatever, or potentially having adverse effects. 
um, you know, are they using a, a reputable um, manufacturer and, and that type of thing. So uh, that certainly can be a, a challenge for sure. Um, I would say the, the majority of, of patients, uh, at least from the evidence and studies, probably take too much melatonin. Uh, the most common doses I see are usually three to six milligrams. Uh, I have seen patients take up to 10 to 20 milligrams, um, which is is probably way more typically than, than a normal patient's going to need. Uh, studies indicate that low doses probably in the 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams, maybe even, maybe even down to 0.1 milligram, uh, are adequate uh, for what the body physiologically needs. And um, while it, it might be tolerated at three milligrams, five milligrams, 10 milligrams, um, it, it's, it's probably, you know, overkill a little bit in, in most situations. So again, you're going to have patients that say, you know, nope, lower dose didn't work, higher doses work, um, you know, and, and it's, it's hard to, to argue with that um, when you're discussing it with a patient. Um, but I, I really try to address the melatonin um, and there's uh, definitely a few questions I, I think about. So first and foremost is, is did it help um, when the, the patient started it? And oftentimes I'll see patients taking uh, either more than one over-the-counter sleep aid or they will be taking a prescription sedating agent, so like a trazodone or a mirtazapine or a Z-drug like Zolpidem and melatonin. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit of, you know, digging into that patient history and say, hey, which one came first? Like, do we need both of these? Which ones provided more benefit? So digging into that and addressing that when we're talking polypharmacy um, is, is a, a big concern because often these patients are on, you know, 10, 20 plus medications. So uh, did it help? And are they using more agents or other agents to help with sleep as well uh, is definitely a, a question I ask. Um, is it hurting? I would say in, in most cases, it's pretty well tolerated. Um, you know, however, I, I have seen occasional issues with um, some CNS changes, um, uh, things like over, over sedation, uh, some cognitive impairment uh, kind of concerns, again, particularly at higher dosages. So I typically try to steer people towards lower doses if they're, they're asking me in most situations. Um, there is also the, the rare concern for elevated prolactin levels. So if you remember uh, dopamine blocking agents such as antipsychotics, these can cause uh, that risk and that can lead to you know, sexual dysfunction, infertility risks, um, inappropriate uh, milk production and, and release from the, the breasts in females. Uh, there's been associations with lower bone mineral density. So uh, there are some potential risks with it and I tend to get more and more concerned as the, the doses escalate. Uh, for the, the patients there. So again, critical question, is it hurting the patient in some way, shape, or form? Uh, I generally ask, are they, they willing to, to try or taper off um, or at least reduce the dose? Um, so that's a, a good question to ask, particularly if they picked it up over the counter and they started taking five milligrams and they say it helps. Well, how, how do you know two and a half milligrams wouldn't work? or one milligram wouldn't work. So again, just making sure if the patient absolutely feels like they need it, um, that we're minimizing the dose is an important thing to, to look at and do there. Uh, and then of course, you know, maybe even prior to all this, I'm looking at that med list saying, hey, are these, is this patient on stimulants? Are they on medications um, that could worsen insomnia? Uh, so, you know, of course, caffeine comes up. Um, some of the antidepressants are more activating than others, you know, such as bupropion. Are they actually on a stimulant for some reason, ADHD medication or something like that? Um, yeah, prednisone, I mentioned caffeine uh, intake is important to, to assess there. So, you know, it's a good situation to, to get a pharmacist involved, um, especially if patients on multiple medications uh, and you're not comfortable with them, um, definitely, yeah, send them to a pharmacist and, and have that med list reviewed. Make sure we're not causing the insomnia, which is 
causing the uh, use of, of melatonin there. All right, so let's take a uh, quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like pharmacotherapy, ambulatory care, MTM, geriatrics, go check out meded101.com slash store. Uh, in addition, if you're a pharmacy student, we've got Naplex content as well and links to rxgrad.com. So go check that out. Uh, if you're a healthcare professional just looking for more education on pharmacology, drug interactions, uh, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. Uh, got a ton of different links to books and educational materials that can uh, really be beneficial for various um, uh, groups of healthcare professionals that have to uh, work with a lot of these patients that are on 5, 10, 20 plus medications. So uh, again, meded101.com slash store. Uh, your support there certainly helps uh, this podcast helps us keep it free uh, and, and available for all to uh, benefit from. All right, so let's wrap up with drug interactions. Uh, I would say there's probably not a ton with melatonin, so that's that's a good thing. Um, probably the first thing that comes to mind is kind of those additive effects, so uh, sedating type agents. Um, you know, that, that a patient's taking, you know, we could definitely... Uh, overly sedate the patient if we add on melatonin to a, a patient taking, you know, diphenhydramine, cyclobenzaprine, Z drugs, opioids, gabapentin, um, all the sedating agents that, that you can think of. Uh, we could certainly have an additive effect there. Uh, hyperprolactinemia. So if you've got dopamine uh, blocking agents, such as the antipsychotics, like I mentioned, or metoclopramide, um, there could be an elevated risk for running into hyperprolactinemia uh, if melatonin's added. So again, more and more likely as we get to, to higher doses, but something to, to pay attention to there. Uh, propranolol may reduce uh, c concentrations or the, the effect from, from melatonin, so that's one to, to think about clinically. Uh, caffeine alcohol intake, you know, these can mess with insomnia. So again, um, going back and, and you want to reassess those patients um, and see, you know, what they're doing in their life potentially that could um, increase the risk of insomnia, hopefully before we add the medication, but um, in patients that, that aren't responding, um, that might be a situation where, you know, maybe they, they've started to increase their caffeine caffeine intake or, or something else is, is going on. So, again, do that thorough investigation, um, help prevent and, and reduce the risk for, for drug interactions there. All right, so I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, sign up, get that free 31-page PDF, kind of a no-brainer there. Uh, and share us with friends, colleagues, uh, those that are, are going through healthcare classes and pharmacology classes specifically. Um, share the podcast, and, and hopefully they can uh, pick up some, some practice pearls as well as kind of refreshing them uh, for their uh, exams or, or board exams, whatever they're uh, working on. So, again, appreciative to all of you uh, who have uh, been been sharing the podcast, and um, uh, the growth of the podcast has been uh, far beyond uh, what I what I ever could imagine. So, I I truly want to thank you guys for the the help and and support for sure. So, uh, if you got comments, uh, questions, mededucation101 at gmail dot com is the best place to reach me. Um, otherwise, you can connect with me on LinkedIn as well. I'm fairly active there. Uh, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCG, BCPS. So uh, I'm going to sign off for today. Thanks so much for listening. Take care. Hope you have a great rest of your day.